Good evening, everyone. How are we all? My name's Chantelle. I'm the principal of this beautiful school with your beautiful children. Um, tonight, we will be hopefully... Okay. Um, demystifying the, uh, the HSC for you. So your kids are almost finished year 11, which means they have probably about... 45 weeks of school left before their HSC exams. Who's terrified? You should be, yeah. Um, so they're about to turn into, if they haven't already, um, big balls of stressy, anxious messes, or not. Um, either way, not good. So um, we have Trudy here from NESA, um, or UAC. UAC, so University's Mission Centre. She will talk you through tonight the, the HSC, scaling, ATAR, University admissions, all of that sort of stuff. Um, we'll then have uh, Darren Percy, our, our Deputy Principal, he'll talk to you just about what happens at the end of year 11 when they drop their subjects and, and, and what subjects they should drop and all that sort of th stuff. Um, and then we'll have our wellbeing people here to have a chat to you about taking care of your child's well-being but also your well-being because this can be a really stressful time for parents as well and if it is ever really really stressful I always have a box of tissues and a container of lollies in my office they're for you for the staff they're not for me sort of um, anyway so I'll now get Trudy up here just to to demystify the HSC we hope there we go Good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, my name's Trudy Noller. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at UAC, not NESA. Um, NESA, of course, does a whole heap of different things to us, but um, hopefully you'll get a whole heap of information that you can take away with you and, you know, really understand that ATAR and, and what it's all about and how it um, looks the way it does at the end of the day. Um, OK, we can move on from that. Um, so, for those of you who don't know who UAC is, UAC or the University's Admission Centre is an organisation actually owned by the universities, but we're an organisation that looks after applications for university entry for 28 different institutions across New South Wales and the ACT. We also administer applications for our equity schemes or our access schemes, um, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail in, uh, later on in the presentation, but the one thing that we're most most known for is the fact that UAC actually owns and calculates the ATAR for all New South Wales HSC students. Now we do work very closely with NESA because we need, of course, the data from NESA to be able to calculate that ATAR. We are going to talk about the ATAR. It is something that I do like to talk about because many people don't quite understand it and I like to talk about it in fairly simple terms so that you can go away feeling a lot more calmer about what's ahead um, for your students. The first thing I want to talk about in, before we talk about calculation is the difference between HSC marks and the ATAR because once you understand that difference it's much easier to understand why the ATAR may look the way it does. Um, at the end of year 12, of course, NESA, or the New South Wales Education Standards Authority, um, they, of course, report to your sons or daughters um, the HSC courses they have completed. They also give them a, an HSC mark for each course that they have done and, of course, that uh, the performance bands that those marks align to. So, those HSC marks are telling you about how well your student has performed in each course in the HSC. UAC, on the other hand, relays one number to your son or daughter, um, and that one number, named the ATAR, tells them where they are positioned amongst all other students in the state. So it's performance versus position. We talk about it with students all the time, like being in a running race, because that's really easy to understand. And that is that all Year 12 students are in this running race, and they may get to the very end. So your son or daughter might get to the very end of that race. They're standing at the finish line. They're thrilled with themselves because they've done their personal best performance. But when they look around, they may still be positioned in the middle of the pack. So their best performance, their, their personal best, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to come first, yeah? 
that's un easy to understand. So performance versus position. The only thing that students can control in this whole scenario is how well they're going to perform. They can't control their ATAR or their position because they can't control the competition. They can't control how everybody else is doing in the HSC. All right? I think if I walked away saying that, you'd feel a lot better and not say anything more. But we are going to talk more about it. So what is the ATAR? The Australian Tertiary Admissions Rank is just that. It's a rank. It is not a mark or a score. It will not define them as students for the rest of their academic life. It just tells us that at the end of Year 12, here they are positioned for the sole purpose of universities to rank and select students. People always ask me, well, why do they need it? Aren't they going to get rid of the ATAR, blah, 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 blah. We hear that all the time, every year. I've been with you at for 15 years, and it's never been any different. Um, the universities do need something, do need a measure of achievement so that they can put their students into the right courses because they can't also have every student in the same course at the same university. So they need some parameters to work with. So that's why the ATAR is the way it is. Okay, that's why they, it's there, that's why they use it. Yes, many universities use lots of other things these days, but they always have. Okay, it's just a little bit more pronounced these days than it used to be. Of course, as I said, it is a number between 0 and 99.95, um, and it is all about position. Um, the other day, I still got asked by a teacher, actually, which I found interesting, why can't I get an ATAR of 100? Well, being a rank, you actually can't have a rank of 100, because if you did, it would mean that you have beaten 100% of the cohort, including yourself. So 99.95 it is. And it's the same all over the country, OK? Same all over the country. So how do we calculate it? So your, um, your sons and daughters are in year 11. They would have been completing 11 units of study, at least, to satisfy HSC eligibility. When they get to year 12, some students keep 12 units, some drop down to 10 units, some have extension courses, so they might have 11 units or they may have 13 units. They're all different. That is something you need to talk to your school about because I don't know their academic abilities, so I can't advise on that. But to calculate an ATAR, we do need 10 units of study, which can, um, which is, of course, as it says there, two units of English and then another eight remaining units, which can only include two units of what we classify as Category B courses. So that's your VET framework course with the exam. And students must sit that optional exam to have it there for inclusion uh, of calculation. Interesting, interestingly enough, we have about 68% of students that only do 10 units. Now, when we do the calculation, we are using not HSC marks, but scaled marks. And this is the thing that a lot of students talk about, scaling, you know. If I do certain courses, it's going to scale me up. If I do other courses, it's going to scale me down. That's absolutely not correct, OK? It's definitely not correct. So let's talk about scaling. Scaling is just the first step in the calculation of the ATAR. We have 117 HSC courses. The calculation of scaling is 117 simultaneous equations that determines the scale mean of the course and the standard deviation. For those of you who are not mathematically minded like myself, don't even worry about it, OK? I'm just telling you because I'm sure to get asked. But what that equation does is basically lining students up in academic order in a particular course and at the same time, so simultaneously, looks at how well they're doing in everything else that they're studying. Okay? It then takes the average of all of this with the average of this that determines the scale mean of this particular course that we're interested in. Some courses have higher scale means than others. OK, yes, that's true. But that's not to say we're scaling people up or down. So we do it so we, why do we do it? We do it so that um, we can create a more even playing field. We do it to take away the difference between patterns of study. So like Nessa, who looks after assessment marks and the moderation of assessment marks to basically take away the difference between schools, we scale to take away the difference between patterns of study. 
Um, why do we have to do that? Last year we had nearly 71,000 HSC students, 27,000 different patterns of study, 20,000 patterns were unique. So if that's the case, how do we line everybody up in academic order for the sole purpose of university entry into a whole variety of different university courses? You know, they don't all do maths and science when they get there. You know, we've got a, a, a big group of students doing lots of different things, like in the HSC. Um, and we do it so that no student is either advantaged or disadvantaged because of the course choice. So, when, we, when students talk, they're talking about doing certain courses to scale them up and down, but in actual fact, that is incorrect terminology because we're not scaling anybody up or down. We're not scaling courses, we're actually scaling the academic ability of students within the course. That's why any data that we have changes from year to year because it depends on the cohort. Um, as I said before, uh, the scale mean of the course is, can be different from course to course. Courses with a high scale mean or a higher scale mean than others is just basically telling us that when we look at the students in that particular course, that in general, they're not just doing well in that course, but they're doing very well in everything else they study. So their academic ability is usually, in general, fairly high. Other courses with a lower scale mean just basically tells us that the academic ability of students within that course varies from high to low. It does not mean you cannot get a high ATAR that includes a course with a lower scale mean because you absolutely can. You just have to be a little bit further to the top of that course to get more benefit from scaling. Okay, so it's really not anything that a student should worry about. It's irrelevant, of course, that they study. They just need to be putting in the effort to get the best marks possible to then position themselves right, to then get a more positive ATAR. I'm going to show you some data from last year because this will help cement um, what I'm telling you. So here is just a couple of courses, starting with Investigating Science, Business Studies, English Advanced, Visual Arts, Maths Advanced, Physics, Aboriginal Studies, French Continuous and Hospitality. Hospitality is one of those Category B courses that we talk about, the VET framework courses that people say don't do, you can't get a high ATAR, which is, as I said before, not correct. The next column I'm, um, you'll see is the median performance band. Now, the performance band has no bearing on the calculation of the ATAR whatsoever. That's Nessa's stuff, but it does tell you something, and it does tell you where the middle of the cohort is. For many courses, it's a band four. For some, it's a band five. But in general, a band four is about it, because there's about 40% of students that get marks in that area. So band four, for those parents not understanding what they are, means you're getting marks between 70 and 79, OK? A band one marks below 50, a band two is 50 to 59, band three, 60 to 69, and so on, all right? So the next column is interesting as well, okay? This shows us the median HSC mark for each of these courses. Now, when I was at school back in the dark ages, we got marks between one and 100, and you got over 50, and you went, oh, yeah, thanks, I've passed. It's not like that. There's no sense of failing the HSC. But what we do need to understand is that the majority of HSC marks lay between 50 and 100, not one and 100. As I said, only band one students get marks below 50 and there's very few of them. So if we think middle mark, it's not 50, the middle mark in general is around 75 and can be higher depending on the course. Last year, out of the 117 courses, there was only about 20 with a median mark or a middle mark below 75. So if we're thinking about the ATAR and we're thinking it's about position, then we need to be thinking, right, well, we need to be getting marks on or above the middle to be positioned in the top 50%. Yeah? Understandable? Yeah. All right, let's have a look at the next column. The next column shows you the HSC mean or the average performance of students in the course. It's not that much different to the middle mark, okay? 
the next column is the scaled mean. This is the thing that people look at and make all sorts of assumptions over because of the scaling up or down. Um, but the scaled mean is always lower than the HSC mean, all right? Because one's about average performance where the scale means about average position. And you know, performance and position can look different like in the running race. You can see that they are quite varied um, from you know, 64.4 last year for English Advance um, down to, what's the lowest there? Aboriginal Studies, which was 30.4. That wasn't the lowest, I have to tell you as well. Um, so many people will look at that and say, well, I can't get a high ATAR if I study Aboriginal Studies. Absolutely incorrect. If we look at the next column, the next column shows you the maximum ATAR achieved by a student where both units of the course were included in the calculation of their ATAR. So if we have a look at Aboriginal Studies, um, 98.35. I'd be pretty happy with that. Let's look at our hospitality, you know, don't do one of those courses, you can't get a high ATAR, 99.9. .9. If you have a look at any of the data on the UAC website, the scaling report, it will tell you the same for just about every single course. I think there's only one course with a, um, a maximum ATAR that was lower than seven, uh, 95, so there's not that many. Um, the next column shows you the maximum ATAR achieved where, of course, the student um, studied the course but it wasn't included in their ATAR, but it doesn't matter, R not really. They're all high. It doesn't matter what you do, you just have to be getting marks on or above the middle to get a more positive ATAR. All right? Position, position, position. Okay, let's look at the next um, slide. This is Fred and Laura, and Fred and Laura um, I've been talking about for 15 years, um, and we calculate their ATAR every single year. These are two students who have completed exactly the same HSC courses. You can see that Fred gets marks of 70 and Laura marks of 80. So 10 marks difference, but when we look at their ATARs, they are 20 points apart. Now their ATARs go up and down all the time, depending on who we calculate, which year they're going through, and they change every single year. If we have a look here at Fred, he'll ring us on ATAR day and say, Miss, there's something wrong, you've calculated it wrong, what's happened, 58's not an average, how do you do that? And the next sentence that comes out of Fred's mouth is, oh, I know, you scaled me down because I did visual arts. And that is a really typical conversation, but in actual fact, that is not the case. The actual story behind the ATAR is not in the HSC marks, because remember, we're not using those. We're using scaled marks. The actual story behind this is in that percentile column, because this is showing us where each of these students were positioned in their courses last year. So for instance, a mark of 70 in biology last year placed Fred in the 37th percentile, meaning that 63% of students got marks better than him. Laura, on the other hand, 10 marks more put her in a much better position. She only had 28% of students ahead of her. If we look at English Advanced, mark of 70 placed him in the seventh percentile. 93% of students got marks better than 70 last year in English Advanced. Sort of makes your mind boggle, doesn't it? Um, mark of 80 still placed Laura in the bottom 50% of students for English Advanced. If we have a look at the percentile column for Fred, you can see that he's got lots of students ahead of him um, in every single course. And even if we just align his marks with the median mark, you can see his marks lay beneath the middle. So if his marks lay beneath the middle, then it stands to reason that his ATAR will lay beneath the middle, which last year was 70.4. And it always sits around that 70. So that's the ATAR. I hope you, um, you got something out of that. And I think, you know, when you're talking to your sons and daughters, um, just remind them that the only person that can scale them down is themselves by not putting in that effort and getting the best marks they possibly can. Um, all right, let's talk about applying to university through UAC. I want to go through this with you. I know that they're only in year 11, but it's good to know what's ahead um, and what kind of applications are out there. We run by key dates, okay? Now, this is this year's key dates. 
but what I can tell you the the applications for universities open in April every year and in April on that day that we open it's usually around the first or the second depending on what's happening um, we will send your sons and daughters um, an email to the email address they have listed with Nessa um, and we'll send an email saying hey this is your UAC PIN, you'll need this plus your NESA student number to actually lodge an application online through the UAC website. And we'll keep updating them throughout the year and we'll also send them the PIN uh, email throughout the year because as I have experienced many, many times, including with my own um, daughters, you know, they always lose it. So we do keep updating. Now, if it is that they've lost that PIN, Okay, and they say, Mum, can you ring up? Sorry, unfortunately, we can't talk to Mum or Dad. Um, they have to ring up themselves because it's a secure PIN. So it's like their bank details. We will only give the information directly to them unless they've applied and they list you as an agent to act on their behalf, then we can talk to you, all right? So just be aware of that um, if they need something get them to call in the first instance, but after that, as long as they've got you on their application, then everything is fine. As I said, we run by a, a course of dates. We usually have some earlier dates in September is um, when our school's recommendation scheme applications close. That's about early entry, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, the early bird is different to early entry. Early bird is the early bird close of applications, meaning that they will only pay an early bird fee. This year it's $73. If they applied after the 30th, they're paying $200, which is the standard fee. And I don't want any Year 12 students paying that sort of money. Um, a lot of them think, well, if I put it in, am I locked into the preferences they've got on that application when they submit? No, they're not. They can change them around throughout the process. So, you know, if they're not quite sure what they want, just put it in before the end of September with one preference and then they can go from there. Um, there's all sorts of other dates. There's, um, in November we start giving offers for early entry. Um, December is when ATAR comes out and of course then all the ATAR offers come out at that time. For those um, who have got sons or daughters wanting to apply for medicine, uh, medicine offers uh, don't go out until January each year because I have to wait to get the full uh, um, criteria locked in and I know that over Christmas and in that first part of January they're doing interviews and things like that for that particular course. All right, so let's, when we talk about applying, we put it into four different areas. Um, prepare, apply, accept and manage. The first one is prepare um, and this you know, it's a good night to be here because we're in the middle of open season. The universities have all got open days and I would certainly recommend that you get on to your children to um, get to those open days this year because next year it could be trials and all sorts of things happening. Um, we always say go and have a look because it's the best way you can find out whether you're going to like a place. Um, it's like, you know, buying your car. You go and test drive it and kick the wheels, don't you? see if it works. You've got to do that with your university, okay? Because it's not just about your degree, it's also about what they have on offer for the student. You know, do they have things like international exchange? Can they park on campus? If they can, you know, do they have to pay for their parking? Is there public transport? You know, all, all those sorts of things that come with going to uni, okay? So they want to go and research what's on offer. Um, another thing they need to do is investigate all course possibilities. Like I was saying before, medicine is really hard to get into. We have about 10,000 students sitting the UCAT test to get into medicine, and we only have a couple of thousand um, places across all the different universities that offer medicine. So there's every likelihood they're not going to get in. So what are they going to do? What's their next option? How are they going to get to where they want to be? So they want to look at all the different course possibilities. Or they might want a specific engineering degree, you know, aerospace or something like that. Once again, really competitive to get into. What if they don't get there? What's their next choice? 
So these are the things you need to do. And, and what if I'm Fred and my ATAR is less than Fred? What am I going to do then? You know, most of our universities have pathways into uni. Some of them have diploma courses, which are fantastic programs where you can then study the diploma and then at the end you're guaranteed entry into the degree and then you're studying in your second year because that diploma course is your first, basically the first year of uni. So I would never count any of those things out because at the end of the day, what if something goes pear-shaped and you're not prepared? So look at all course possibilities, investigate everything and of course additional selection criteria could come into it. There's not that many courses with additional selection criteria but things like med, uh, vet science, dentistry, um, fine arts degree may need a, a portfolio, music, an audition, things like that. So it's a really good time when you go to those universities to investigate everything that's on offer. Um, something that you might find interesting as well, I know I did with my own daughters, is in general they have um, professors and lecturers uh, give uh, talks on the different degrees that they are, you know, teaching and it can really help make or cement some ideas about what it is that you know your sons or daughters might be um, interested in. I know that mine came out thinking okay well yeah I didn't like the sound of that or yeah that really sparked my interest. So it's a good thing to do. Um, when they come to apply it is all just online and as I said it happens in April each year. Um, they can list up to five preferences at any one time on that application and they can change the preferences as many times as they like. Now, uh, people ask what is a preference? A preference is basically a, core, a specific course at a specific university at a specific campus. Lots of specifics. But anyway, you can list, of course, the same course at five different universities. You could list five different courses at one university or anything in between. All right, the court, the... the, the um, choices theirs, but they can keep changing them throughout the process. The record is 147 times. Um, when the applications open, so do the access schemes, which I'm going to quickly go through. So the first one is Educational Access Scheme. This is part of the uni application. They'll find the link once they've submitted their preferences. And this is for students who have suffered some form of disadvantage through years 11 and or 12 that has been a long-term um, long disadvantage for six months or longer. Um, it, there is about eight categories with 30 different disadvantage types, ranging from long-term medical through to refugee status, financial hardship, and so on. Um, this particular application, students will need supporting documentation and they may need help from school with an educational impact statement or from doctors or from, um, you know, lawyers or, or whatever, whatever, depending on whatever it is that you're applying under. Um, students have to have this application in no later than uh, the middle of November each year so that when the ATAR is released, this application can be considered. This application is not for early entry applications, this is only for ATAR based offers. All right. It is special consideration. What else does it do? Um, it's not a guarantee of entry. Okay, it's not a guarantee, but it may just help a student get into a course if they're missing a couple of points. You know, when they look at courses, they've got to look at what we call the lowest selection rank for the course. That's what you need to get yourself in. Lots of universities give points. Um, educational access scheme or EAS is something that may give them a couple of points that may sit on top of their ATAR to change their selection rank for a particular course at a particular uni. So that's how that works. It's really just special consideration because of that disadvantage. All right, so next one is school's recommendation scheme. This is an early entry scheme. This is the centralised early entry scheme. Some of our institutions have direct applications that the students can put in, but we also have a, a, a centralised application. It is separate to the uni application. They don't list preferences on this because we marry it up with the preferences they have on their uni application. 
Um, and this is where students are considered based on the year 11 results and the school's recommendation. Now students, all they have to do is tick a couple of boxes to say they want to be considered, submit the application and then put their feet up for most, in most cases because UAC will get the year 11 results directly from NESA and then contact the school to do the recommendation. It's fairly straightforward. There are a couple of institutions such as Sydney, New South and UTS that you have to be um, financially disadvantaged to be considered for their early entry scheme. But apart from that, there's about 12 other universities that don't have that criteria. So, you know, some students put their backup plan at those universities if they want the, you know, big three, basically. But, you know, they might want to go to, uh, doesn't matter what university they want to go to, they can get early entry um, for different reasons. If a student um, <coughs> puts in an early entry application with a university direct, they don't put that preference on their UAC application, but if they don't get an offer to the direct application, that's when they'll put that preference back on the UAC application to be considered in the traditional format of ATAR. The next one is equity scholarships. Um, this is another application that students can take on. This is about money um, and, of course, students would need to be on Centrelink benefits going forward. Many Year 12 students aren't, but if they are, they can apply for this. If they find that throughout their degree that they become uh, recipients of a Centrelink benefit, then they would apply for this, because this is open to um, not just Year 12 students, but also current uni students. Apart from that, there's like millions of dollars of scholarships out there direct uh, with the universities and um, I would certainly encourage your sons and daughters to be applying for absolutely everything they possibly can. Um, you'd be amazed how many students don't apply for these scholarships because they say, well they look in the mirror and say, well they're never going to pick me, which is absolutely incorrect, okay? I just cannot stress enough but to get them on to the university websites at this time next year to find out what kind of scholarships are available to them so that they end up with you know thirty thousand dollars in their pocket um, to go towards whatever it is that they need for uni all right so the next is managing i'm going to just talk quickly about um, selection ranks adjustment factors and so on um, but a selection rank, of course, is the thing that the universities use to select students, okay? They don't look at them individually, one by one. It's an automated system. The university says, here's all the applicants that have applied to us. This is the calibre. This is the parameters we're going to put in place. Uh, this offer round comes along. They, we do this automated system and it picks every student who's got an ATAR or a selection rank of that and above for the particular courses. All right, so that's how it works. But a selection rank could be just an ATAR, it could be an ATAR plus adjustment points, or it could be an ATAR plus adjustment plus additional criteria. Each one of those things is a number that we add together that then becomes the selection rank for the course at that particular uni that the student has on their application. Um, adjustment points, there's four different types. One is subject adjustments, so that is that they've done very well in year 12, they've got a band five or six in a particular course that relates to the degree they're trying to get into. In particular, you know, let's say maths advanced and they want to get into engineering, they relate. They got a band, you know, six, so the university down the road said, great, you've done so well, we're going to give you three adjustment points for that. That three will sit on top of their ATAR to change their selection rank. Uh, the other one, location adjustments. Some institutions have location adjustments, meaning that your um, they, the student is uh, within their catchment, and they might give a couple of adjustments there. Not all universities have that. Um, some do, but not all. Um, the other is equity, so that's the EAS that I was talking about before. And the last one is elite athlete and performer. So if your son or daughter is performing at state or national level for whatever sport or so forth, um, then they can be considered based on that as well. With equity, you have to apply. With elite athlete and performer, you must apply, and that's directly with the university. The other two, subject and location, 
it's automatic. They don't have to apply, but they should research it on each institution's website because they clearly tell you what they, they're going to give. But they do cap their adjustment points. Okay, so some at five, some at 10. I know one university is at 12, but they do cap them. So they're not gonna get tens of thousands of them and it's not all gonna give them 99.95. All right, so this is quickly how um, adjustment factors work. And if here we have a university who've said, we've got a new course, but we can only accept three students but we've had six apply. We've lined them up in order of their selection rank from um, 90, 89, sorry, down to 84. You can see they're made up of all different things. Some it's just their ATAR, some it's ATAR plus adjustments. Now, you do hear some students say, oh yeah, my friend next door, they got into a course, but their ATAR was actually lower than my friend up the road who has not made an offer. What happened there? Well, the friend up the road was, didn't get any adjustments and the, the um, the this here this whatever that is thing on the on the on the <laughs> on the wall um, it tells us that we can see here that we the university picked the top three person number three actually had an ATAR lower than person number four but they still got in because they had four adjustments that changed their selection rank now person number three their selection rank is now what we call the lowest selection rank for the course because they were the last person in the door, all right? And that's what we get students to look at, the lowest selection rank that gives them a guide as to what it is they're going to need. Now that changes from year to year, but not by lots, um, but it just about um, supply and demand, of course. All right, so let's move on. Changing of preferences. As I said before, students can list up to five on their application. They can change them around as many times as they like. But once they've got their ATAR, they need to be fairly strategic. We would always say keep your dream course as your first preference, no matter what. And then after that, make sure you look at the lowest selection rank for the course. Make sure you're willing to go to that particular university and do the particular course because you'd be amazed how many ring up and say, I got into this, but I can't travel to Bathurst. Um, so just be realistic and monitor the close of preference dates. We have what we call close of preference dates and offer dates. It's, they're usually about four or five days apart. You can't change your preferences between them. Um, so, you know, if they miss out on that time, then they'll just have to wait till we open again and they can change their preferences to be considered again. If they get an offer, we would always say to them, accept the offer because there's no guarantee of another one. And then if they want to be considered for something else, they need to remove the offer that they got from their preference list, rearrange them, add them, take them off what they, whatever they need to do, and then we'll consider a new five or whatever five they've got on their, in the next offer round. So, if, of course, your sons or daughters get more than one offer through the um, admissions cycle, um, please advise them that you know, they can accept them all, that's fine, but at the end of the day, they can only study one course and they need to make decisions pretty quickly about which one they're going to keep. And we do advise them that they must get back to the university that they've accepted an offer for where they're not going to study because they could, uh, of course, gather academic or financial penalties if they keep that acceptance open. All right, so they need to get on top of it pretty quickly. As I said, they can change their preferences around as many times as they like, but everything they do once they've got an offer is directly with the institution themselves. Um, yeah, I think that's about it for me. Um, happy to take any questions a bit later on, but I know that it's eager to talk. Got any questions? Yes. No. No. What was the question? The question was, he, there's a larger number of students in this cohort, will it affect the offers, correct? Yeah, no, it doesn't, won't affect them. It's all about supply and demand, yes. Yeah, 
they, they don't usually fill every single place, so it won't make any difference. The only prob the only ones that there's um, you know always that, those competitive courses like medicine or, or vet or um, physiotherapy, interestingly enough, is really competitive as well. So you usually find that if we've got a lot more students applying, then the lower selection rank will go up because they've got higher demand. So, yeah, they, they, they do adjust those lower selection ranks once they see what the calibre of the students are. Anything else? Yes, sorry. Doesn't affect domestic students whatsoever. International students, um, what's the quota? How, how does it affect domestic students? It doesn't affect domestic students. They're in a different pool of, um, of applicants. Okay, yes. Yes. No. Absolutely. Yep, they can. Um, they can get early entry offers direct with some institutions. They could also get an early entry offer with UAC through Schools Recommendation Scheme. They can accept all of them and just put them aside. If they want to be considered, as I said before, in another offer round, they just have to remove the preference they've got on their UAC application. Use the remove the offer, sorry, um, from their preference list and then rearrange them and be considered all over again. We have two offer rounds per month from November through to March. Um, the first three, so in November and the first one in December, is based on early entry for schools recommendation scheme. Um, and then after that, it's all based on ATAR. Now, some early entry schemes, you, uh, they will only get conditional offers on condition that they meet certain requirements. In many cases, it's a minimum ATAR. If that's the case, then they would still have to have that preference on their list in December when the ATAR is released um, to then, you know, maybe get an offer to that course. Many universities, you'll hear this, they'll say you need to put it as your first preference to get an offer. No, it's in order of the student's preference. The universities don't know where you've preferenced them. They just know that you've got a preference with them. So it's a, still about order of the student's preference. So if they got a conditional offer, but that's not really what they want, then they would maybe put it as their fifth or fourth preference and have whatever else they want to be considered before that above it. If they don't get an offer to any of the ones above it, then they will get, and they've met the conditions, then they will get an offer to that lower preference. Every preference is considered equal. Um, a student that has it as a, as a first preference and another one having it as a fifth preference, that doesn't matter. If the person, you know, might get it number one and the other person might get it at number five, depending on, you know, what they're eligible for at the end of the day. Yes. If they don't get any offers, what happens if they fall off the second round? Yes, there are. Um, if, if a student doesn't get an offer, it usually means they've been a bit unrealistic with their preference list. That's why we say look at the lowest selection rank to see if you're going to make that, make it a different, you know, make it into that course. Um, at the end of the day, let's say they were like Fred and, if, and their ATAR was maybe a lot less than Fred and they didn't get made an offer. In many cases, our universities will give what we call slip back offers. So they'll get in contact and say, hey, we saw that you didn't get made an offer. Um, we'd like to offer you this prep course or this diploma course or something else that is a lower level of qualification. Um, to get them on their path to wherever it is they want to go. So these, these happen all the time. If students don't get anything uh, or, or um, you know, they still want to go to university but they don't like the look of the prep course or whatever, they could go off to TAFE and get a, a certificate for or diploma to get into uni. Um, not all universities will um, look at a certificate, most will look at a certificate for, 
except Sydney. Um, so you would need a diploma for them, but um, many others will look at a certificate for for entry into different degrees. If it's medicine they're looking for, then they're probably going to have to do something totally um, out of the box to get there. Anything else? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, so when it comes to um, the calculation, we break all subjects down into single unit lots. So every course is two units except for those extension courses. So because we cut them down the middle 50-50, we then pick the best scaled marks. So if the one unit course has got a better scaled mark than something else, we'll use that and just one unit of the other course if it's at 11 units they've got. So we do pick the best that we possibly can um, out of the uh, courses that they've completed. Yes? Um, if a student wants to take a gap year, as they call it, people ask me, how do they apply for a gap year? They don't, they just have one. Um, but we would always advise students to, if they, especially if they know what they want to do at uni, is apply in year 12 because they have the bonus of adjustment points. Whereas once they're out of year 12, they don't come into play. And then they'll just defer their course for the 12 months. If they don't know what they want to do, then don't worry about it. Wait till the next year. They still just apply through UAC the next year and we go through the same process, same timeline and, and so on. Someone else had, yes? Um, there's no correlation between number of units and high ATARs. Um, yeah, it's, it's really personal choice and really depends on the student and their time management and how they're going. And, and that's where I say talk to your school because they know them best to be able to handle that. Yeah. Yes. No. When we do the calculation, there's nothing to do with the school or where they live, nothing. It's just all about the data, the, the students' marks. And we use 50% of their moderated assessment mark and 50% of their raw exam mark, drawing them together to then do the scaling and so forth. There's a fellow, yeah, yes. How do they know? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, look, schools track their students very well, so they should be able to tell you sort of how they're going. Um, I think, yeah, anyway. That's it. Fantastic, thank you very much. The, the estimated ATAR, what we're going to be doing with Year 11 this year is um, providing them with an indicative ATAR based on their Year 11 results. Um, and then from there, that's when what Mr Percy is about to talk to you, uh, what Mr Percy is going to talk to you about now, um, which subjects they should drop, should they drop, should they take on an extra extension, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, introducing Mr Percy, he is your child's deputy principal. You've probably seen him once or twice before, soccer coach extraordinaire. Thank you, Mr Percy. Thank you very much. Um, you look very much like your children and I can tell because the front three rows are empty that you are your, your, your children's parents. Um, if you would like to stand up and just have a quick stretch, please do. Uh, I'll speak to you very briefly um, about the process leading to the end of this term. So in week nine and ten of this term we are doing our prelim exams. In Year 11, they do three assessment tasks that count towards the preliminary examination, towards the prelim certificate. The final one is a, I guess, a test in a hall that in some way goes to mirror the trial and the HSC that they eventually will sit. That happens in week nine and 10. 
During the holidays, our teachers will be marking, they'll be going through and making sure that we can then have conversations with the kids when they come back at the beginning of Term 4. When we start Term 4, it's actually Term 1 of Year 12. That's when the HSC course starts. The prelim is put aside and the HSC course begins, start of Term 4. Now, three assessment tasks in Year 11, those go towards a grade, an A to E grade that we submit into NESA. Part of those grades, the students will try and use for early entry, which Trudy just spoke about. What we will be doing and having conversations already with the kids is about preparing them for these prelim exams because we don't want to hear at the end of the day, oh, I didn't try, it wasn't worth it, I got bad marks, you know, that's because I didn't try. That's the absolute last thing that I want to hear. We are going to have some really good conversations with them when they come back. We're going to have some learning conferences in the first week and second week of term four. During that time, we'll talk to them about how they've gone in their exams. We will talk to them about their subjects. We will talk them to them about what we're calling an indicative ATAR. If we get students who don't try, don't do anything in term three prelim exams, their indicative ATAR is going to be well below Fred's. It's going to be dirt. You can't have a really good conversation. So the conversations I've been having with the kids are about putting a study routine into place, making sure they give it a proper crack, because it's going to give them some really important feedback. They're going to reflect on their own learning and work out where to next. During these learning conferences, they're going to hear these presentations and a couple of others. We're going to do a really quite a lot with them so they understand the process, the rules, and the importance of ranking within their classes. What we won't tell the kids to do is drop a subject. We won't tell them which subject to drop. That will be their choice. What I can say is over the last five years, by the time they get to HSC here at Freshwater, 98% of the kids are doing 10 units plus an extension. Most kids at this point are starting to already say, I'm dropping that, sir get rid of that one. Oh, I can't stand that. I can't wait till I can drop that. No problem. They've made that decision. Great. They still have to get through it in year 11 so that we can put a grade, otherwise they don't get through. So, conversations so that you're all completely aware. Each student will have a conversation with a mentor teacher. Each teacher will be assigned six, six students. They'll have a significant interview. During that, they'll talk to them about goal setting. They'll speak with them about the subjects that they're doing, positives and negatives, highs, lows, all of those sort of things. They'll start to help the student make a decision whether they want to keep the subjects that they've got, their 12 units, and run through, or whether they want to drop and change a subject. If they want to drop a subject, after that interview, they will come home with a piece of paper. We call them a pink form interviews because the paper's pink. Well, it's actually mauve these days. We've run out of pink. Issues with printing in China, I think. I don't know. The interview they will bring home, this piece of paper. No teacher will tell your son or daughter to drop a subject whether they teach them that subject or not. If I've got little Johnny and I know at geography, he is terrible, cannot sharpen a pencil. I'm not going to tell him to drop geography. That's not my job. The job of the, those conversations is to have a conversation and to give the students the opportunity to ask questions and to make their decision. Once they do that, they come back with a piece of paper. I take them out of that subject, simple. The step between that involves you. They have, to send, they have to give this piece of paper to you and have the conversation with you. You have to sign it before it comes back to me, because if it doesn't have a parent's signature, I don't change the subject. So that's on you. Because the last thing I want is a parent ringing me up and saying, why do you let little Johnny job geography? Not what I want. So that will happen in the first two weeks. We then hit our straps. The timetable will change for the kids. One, when in the first round, let's say, 90% of kids dropped to 10 units. In the old days, when I went to school, 
to answer your question, we did six subjects, we did 12 units, and we kept them all because we would have our five subjects and a spare in case I stuffed one up. The idea now is that all schools, including Manly Selective, who are ranked fifth in the state, kids go to 10 units. Because the time that they were gonna spend on their spare, they take away the three 75 minute lessons. They take away an hour at night. They take away the assessment task and the time they have to spend on the weekend and they put that into the other subjects, bringing everything else up. So that is the approach that it generally most schools are using. I know Trudy said 63% roughly are, are, doing, are doing 10 units. Here at Freshwater and in this community, sorry about that, most students are doing 10 units plus an extension. They can, which is, which is why they have a 50% school moderated mark and 50% exam mark. And that helps, I guess, based on their rank order through the four tasks, helps alleviate that bad exam day. We put some strategies in place so they don't have a bad exam day. But yeah, it can happen. I get it. That's why when they throw the marks over to Trudy's team, and they can do some adjustments based on some things. So, yes? So, when is the That'll happen in the first two weeks of term four. So, once the kids come back, we need to give them their marks back first. Because if I walk out of an exam and, and I think I've stuffed up, I think this is a subject I'm dropping, but in the end of the day, over my three assessment tasks, I'm looking at a 90%. I don't throw away a 90% to keep a 60%. I have a conversation around that. So we want to have a really informed conversation. So once we've got the marks back, we can then have those. Any other questions? That light is beautiful, sir. I can't see a thing. Clear as mud, I like it. We will go through all of this with the kids. If they have any questions or if you have any questions, please see us, happy to have a chat. I'm gonna hand over to our head teacher wellbeing, Kath Moran, she's gonna walk through some of the wellbeing strategies we use with the kids and some of the initiatives we're gonna drive. Okay. Hello, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate your attention. It has been a long time and as Darren said, by this stage we're kind of, uh, chairs and whips if, we, if you're in assembly, so thank you for your attention. Um, having been here since uh, probably the year before your kids were born, um, it's not my first rodeo, so uh, I'm just going to have a chat with you about a few um, strategies to remind you about a few things that you can do as parents to get your kids through the next 12 months and uh, strap yourselves in because you're in for a bit of a ride as are we. And some of the strategies I'm going to talk to you about today, you might, they might look familiar to you, and as a mother as well, um, some of these things I thought, wow, that's what I was doing when they were toddlers. And I can guarantee you there's a reason for that. And if some of you have started to experience some of the emotional highs and lows that come with teenagers, and we know the kids that you have because we have them here with us as well, you'll know what I'm talking about. So some of these are just reminders. Uh, I've actually taken quite a few of them from um, the Student Wellbeing Portal on the Department of Education's website. So you can have a look at these yourself in your own time. But I'm just going to go through a few different um, strategies. So that's where you can find that. We might send it. We follow out some information. We'll send the link to you as well. Um, the first thing is that you guys are adults and you have learnt to manage your time. Uh, your students have not. So if you are able to help them manage their time and managing their study, that would be a really good place to start. Already we're hearing our students say, I don't know how to study, I don't know how to break my time up into usable chunks. If you are an adult who has mastered that skill, share that with your child. We're doing that here at school uh, and they're being taken through um, opportunities on Fridays during our hub sessions where they can actually sit with teachers from various faculties and learn how to do that, break down their time into usable chunks. Um, just a reminder though, their attention span is probably equivalent to their age. It's not very long. Uh, and so when we have them for 75 minutes, and yes, Mr Percy, we do use brain breaks and PDHB for that reason. It's almost impossible for them to study for great amounts of time. So if they say to you they're going to go to your, their room and study for 60 minutes, then realistically they're not using that 60 minutes. 
So they're better off to have little breaks. So have a chat with them about that and, and, and do, help them to set up some time management that is useful for them and that they can, um, you know, they can work through. Uh, the other thing is, and this is one that we sometimes struggle with, particularly this time, we're about to give trial HSC results back. We need to stay positive, and we need our students to stay positive as well. It's important that they don't feel under constant pressure. They come home to you after a long day and they've had four 75-minute lessons with four different teachers in four different subject areas, for the most part. They are tired, and they are feeling under pressure, especially as we roll into Term 4, they will be under no illusion that they are in their HSC year and they will hear it often, each day. So just be aware of that. They will be even more so um, reactive to criticism. So if we're saying things like, you'll never get, you're not gonna do very well, you'll never pass your HSC if you don't improve your study habits, if you don't do your homework, that's likely not to get a great result. Um, so you know your child. Work out the right times to have those conversations. Sometimes it's when they're sitting next to you, you know, when they're learning to drive. Although be careful with that one, because that can, <laughs> that can backfire. But when they're doing something beside you, you know, when you're not having a you know, frontal conversation with them, just slip it into the conversation. Let them know that you're proud of what they're doing and that they are doing well. But recognising that they have a heavy workload. So pick your, pick your battles with that one. Again, like I said, it's a bit like toddler feeding time. Uh, encourage them to be healthy in their lifestyle. It's such a shame that lots of kids drop out of organised sport when they start senior high school. Try and encourage them to keep being physically active. Walk the dog. Go for a walk with their friends. Get out on the weekend and do something that is uh, good for their physical and emotional and mental health. Um, diet's really important too. Uber Eats have a lot to answer for. Right? Try and encourage them to eat well. Um, and to stick... And stop, yeah, stop getting Uber Eats delivered to school. That would be a good message to take home. <laughs> anyone walking through the school with an Uber bag, could be anyone. Tell them we're going to intercept their food and we'll take it to the staff room. Um, this next one's a big one for us. Um, steering them away from distractions where you can. Every single one of them have a mobile distraction device in their pockets. Um, it's really hard for us, without having high expectations in our classrooms, to keep them motivated and not distracted. Every mo notification they get, every time they're distracted by their mobile phone, the research shows it's taking about 30 minutes for them to get back to the focus that they had. So that, you'll have to manage that in terms of your capacities at home. Potentially, though, you do have, you know, capacity to turn off modems if that's necessary, but we're trying to, at the same time, we're trying to teach them to be mindful about how much time they spend on, on online. Um, I heard a teacher today talking about giving his results back for the trial, and he was, before he gave their results back, he was going to talk to them to open up their phones and give him a, a readout of the screen time that they spend per day. And for some kids, it's many, many hours. If you could just have the conversation about... Um, you know, converting some of that screen time to actual study time, even in small chunks, that would help. Um, Mr Kovacs, our librarian, has shared information with students about some apps that are useful. This one's a particularly good one. It's, it's a free one. They can get a free version, and for every 20 minutes that they focus, they get it. They grow a tree in the app. You know, just a bit of a game-based sort of app. But anything like that, if they're into their phone, make it work for them. Put a lock on it. We have some staff who take phones away and put them in boxes. You know, there are options. You can turn the modem off um, because we know it's an addictive habit for them. Um, we also know that a lot of our kids are coping with stress. So encouraging them to maybe take on some meditation or be mindfulness practices, doing things like yoga and meditating is going to be really important for them as they move through their HSC journey. We do have sessions for them here. We offer them during hub time where they can come and do some yoga and some meditation and learn how to actually manage their stress. And we have a plethora of staff here who can help them through that. Uh, and the last point there is look after yourselves as well. If you haven't done this before, it's going to be stressful. There are going to be times where it's going to be particularly stressful and the whole house will be filled with stress. We feel that here. Every year we have half of the school getting ready for the HSC and half of them doing their prelim course. 
So we have to look to manage that and look after our own health as well. Uh, and just to finish up, a few more people that you can actually go to in the school, and I'm going to introduce another person that's going to help with the wellbeing as well. Um, but senior executives, so principal and the deputy principals uh, of the school are really good resources for you, as are our learning enrichment team who are available to support students, uh, any students that have a learning difficulty or a diagnosis requiring additional support are supported through our learning enrichment team. Uh, myself as head teacher wellbeing and the year advisors, and you should by now know who your year advisors are for your uh, um, alphabet groups, and we can share that information with you. I'm going to introduce you in a moment to Fraser Tui, who is our um, recently appointed student support officer. Uh, and also our careers department are great resources for you. But just before I finish up, there's a few different websites I'll point you direction in the direction of. This is our school TV. It has lots of good information about student wellbeing in particular and supports and strategies for you. And it is accessible through our school website. So you can go to our school website, scroll down about two thirds of the way down the page and you'll come to schooltv.me and that has lots of information. You can see there's also an, a library archive. There's masses of information in there that is free and available to you at any time on our school website, you can go and have a look at that. Uh, and the last one are just some external supports, the ones that you're probably aware of but are particularly helpful for students doing HSC and for parents supporting students. Each of these have a high school and senior high school portal where you can go in and have a look at um, some strategies for your students but also for yourselves. So I'm going to introduce you now to Fraser Tui, who is our new SSO. He's an, an important member of the wellbeing team and available for students, and he's going to explain to you what he can actually do to support. So thank you. Thank you. I don't have any slides, um, but my name's Fraser. I'm a student support officer here. Uh, I'm a qualified paramedic and a youth worker. Uh, essentially, like, I'm between... <clears throat> a teacher and a counsellor, someone for students to be able to speak to in a range of circumstances related to wellbeing, issues outside of and inside of school, exam stress and the knock-on effect that comes from that, and whether any of these issues are internal or external support that can be used, I'm able to help build those connections uh, in a very relaxed and informal setting. Um, so just, I just wanted to touch on uh, some of the other points that Cathy's made, uh, especially in the year that they're going into. Uh, I think reassuring your kids that there are three things that they can do every day and they look different for everyone that can just increase the enjoyment of their life. For me, it's as simple as going for a swim, getting a coffee and walking with one of my mates. Uh, a lot of young people tend to push their hobbies aside and interests in year 12. Uh, I believe it forms part of a healthy routine, uh, continuous direction and enjoyment of the day-to-day -day while still being able to achieve. Um, like everyone said tonight, this can be a stressful time for you guys as well. It may not be your first rodeo, but it's important to look after yourselves. Uh, and as Chantel said before, we are also here for that support as well. Finally, uh, anxiety and stress of the outcome of a mark we all know is out of anyone's control. Remember that if your kids get stuck into the process of studying regularly, creating healthy habits around sleep and activity, all the results will look after themselves. Uh, there are plenty of people here whose job is directly related to the well-being of your children, so feel free to reach out uh, and give me some new clients of your children. <laughs> Thanks very much. So that concludes our night. Um, I did want to say to you all, yes, it is the HSC, but the HSC is not the be-all and end-all, um, despite what we're here doing HSC stuff, we're basically an HSC factory, um, it will not determine your kids, your, your child's life forever. And sometimes it's really good to make that clear to them as well. If they're down there and they're doing it, they're in their room and they're doing an assessment task and they're frustrated and they're just like, I just can't do this. Come on, let's go for a walk. Take them out, let's go to the movies, run them a bath, whatever it is, it doesn't, in, in the grand scheme of their life, it really doesn't mean that much. Okay. Are there any questions? Yes, so as um, Mr. As Darren said, we will do this um, after the, the preliminary exam, so week one of term four. All of this information will be shared with them. So for now, you know something that they don't know, which as every teenager will tell you is unbelievably not true. Hire a teenager now while they still know everything, right? Um, but yes, this will all be shared with them early next term. Yep. 
the presentation has been recorded and it will be emailed out to all year 11 parents.